you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Go into the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Wake up, all of you. Mm. Wake, mm -hmm. come. What are we doing? We're praying. Now we can leave this place. Now! Fire to
Yay! It's the birthday of the church. Welcome to our Pentecost service. I hope you enjoy worshipping with us, praying with us and enjoying our sermon. Let's pray together. O oh Lord, our Lord, we open our hearts, we open our minds, we give you our soul and our strength in gratitude, not only for your coming, but releasing the spirit into the world. Touch our lips, touch our tongues this morning. Renew within us a right heart for worship, that we may bring you glory on this birthday of the church. Amen. Well, I'm going to take this hat off. Whilst I do that, I hope the children enjoy the videos. After the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, he appeared to his disciples over a period of 40 days, teaching them about the kingdom of God. On his last day with them, just before he ascended to heaven, he said, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait there for the promise of the Holy Spirit. Once it is given, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The disciples did as Jesus told them. This is their story. We had remained in Jerusalem just as Jesus had asked. Praying and waiting for the day of his promise when the Spirit would be poured out upon us. The day it came, our lives changed forever. What? I can't make out what you're saying. I... What is that noise? Hasanan, I can't hear what you're saying. What is it? I don't know, but it seems to be coming from over there. Well, someone needs to tell them to tone it down. The I can't hear myself. El <laughs> Ah, what? What is going on? Really? At this hour of the morning? But, uh, these all Galileans? Sadly, yes, but we're not all like that. Some of us actually work for a living. What? What do you mean? Well, just look at them. It's obvious they're drunk. Drunk? What mean? You know. Glug, 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 glug. Ah, I know who's famine. <laughs> famine. Yes, now you understand. But they speak in my language. And in mine. They speak of God. What? Of salvation. A messiah? Messiah? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, Cretans, Arabs. We hear them declare the words of God. In our languages. 
What is this? Listen to me. Listen to me. Listen. We are not drunk, as you suppose. No. Oh, right, right. What you see here, what you hear, is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit on all people, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. What is he talking about? You wonder what this is all about? How this can be? I will tell you. You will recall Jesus of Nazareth, who walked among us, a man approved of God by miracles and wonders that God did through him. He was handed over to you by God's plan, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross only days ago. Crucified just outside the city walls. Yet this same Jesus, this same Jesus, God has raised from the dead. What? Raised from the dead? And made to be both Lord and Messiah. And we, we are his witnesses. We have been with Jesus before and after his death. He has poured out his spirit upon us. Impossible. You expect us to believe that? But look, you know some of these men? There is no way they could know these other languages. And speak them fluently. It is a sign. It must be. If, if what you say is true, please tell us. What shall we do? Yes. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And you too will be saved. <laughs> One day after his resurrection, while Jesus was eating a meal with his disciples, he told them that they would soon be given power to take his message all over the world. They would be given the Holy Spirit of God, he said. After he said this, Jesus flew up into the sky right in front of them, and they did not see him again. So the disciples waited and prayed. Ten days later, they were gathered, and a sound like a violent wind came from heaven and filled the house. They looked around and saw what looked like tongues of fire dancing above each of them. They all began to speak in different languages, causing such a commotion that a crowd gathered to see what was going on. Someone accused them of being drunk, so Peter stood up to say something. He told them that they were not drunk, but that God had given them the power of his spirit. He recounted the story of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, and told the people to repent of their sins and trust in Jesus. Forgiven because you were forsaken. 
So our sermon this morning is going to be slightly different. I'm going to base it around three quotes around Pentecost. I've preached through this passage on a number of times. You've heard the sermon a number of times. And this year I just wanted to do something different. I think I'm partly inspired by the challenge uh, a friend of mine brought when we were talking about the fact that as we come out of lockdown, in which we increasingly are, um, we need to be thinking about not putting new wine into old wineskins. How are we going to do church differently as we deal with a new group of people, or at least a different group of people from the one 14 to 16 months ago? So I'm going to base it around three quotes. Now, I hope this works. The first is by a writer called Robert Bayer. Bethlehem was God with us, Calvary was God for us, and Pentecost is God in us. We've been looking at the story, and we've been looking at God's plan from Genesis all the way to Revelation. Well, we're not there yet, but we're getting there. Pentecost is not a mistake. Pentecost is not an afterthought. Pentecost is is part of God's plan and for the first part of our uh, our message today I just want to talk about the fact that part of God's plan is to be God in us not just God with us Emmanuel but actually God in us we start with the Gospels we start with the fact that Matthew and Luke are both recognize and celebrate the ministry that the Holy Spirit plays in the incarnation. He is there at the birth 
and he is there at the baptism, hence the delightful banner that you can't read because it's turned back to front um, behind me. The spirit is intimately linked with Jesus' ministry. And at the end of Jesus' ministry, <coughs> and at the end of Jesus' ministry, he talks about baptism. Matthew 28, verse 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is part of the ministry of the church, part of Jesus' ministry, part of the Father's plan and purpose. In the Old Testament, the, minute, the Spirit is given to people for a short period. And the Spirit is very present in the Old Testament. There are at least 13 to 15 different ways the Spirit moves in the Old Testament, but only in the short term. It's not till we get to the New Testament, where the bud becomes a flower, that we see the Holy Spirit given perpetually to those that believe. Jesus makes the promise in Luke chapter 24, verse 49. I'm going to send you what my father has promised. What my father has promised. But stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. Not really surprised that Luke is making is recording that because it's of course Luke who writes Acts and Acts chapter 2 verses 16 to 21 is all from the prophet Joel that promise made of God but it's also there in John the non um, standardized writer but truly I tell you for it is for it is for your own good that I am going away, says Jesus. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. The ch early church recognised not just the role of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' ministry, but the role of the Holy Spirit in the churches, in the disciples, in the believers' ministry. And we see that come to fruition in Acts chapter 20. Well, Pentecost is Acts chapter 2. It's the birthday of the church, but the birthday of the church only happens in Jerusalem. Now, granted, there are lots of other people there from other nations, hence the gift of tongues, hence the fact that people had to speak in languages <clears throat> that people did, didn't know but could be understood. In Acts chapter 20, that changes. G Peter is talking to Gentiles. He has entered their home. He is eating with them. He has broken down cultural barriers and God is about to break the final barrier. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised Jewish believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Goyim or Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. God was fulfilling the command given to Peter to go to this man's house. He was highlighting it, rubber stamping it, guaranteeing it by sharing this gift amongst even the pagan Gentiles. Then Peter said, surely no one can stand in the way of, their being, of them being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. That's important. That simple sentence, they have received the Holy Spirit just as we have, is significant because it means there is no, there is no Jew and Gentile. There is no them and us. The whole of humanity has been called into saving faith. So he ordered that they be baptised, be washed clean in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. It wasn't enough just to have this experience. They wanted to know more. They wanted to become disciples, not just Christians. And finally, Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, 
he uses a beautiful illustration speaking to the pagans of Corinth who are struggling with their Christianity, who do not know what to believe or more accurately how to behave. When he talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and 6, that the spirit makes them into temples of God. It transforms, transfigures, transmutes the pagan into a child of God. Now, there were circumcised Jewish pagans. There are Christian church attending pagans. There are non-believing pagan pagans. But when the spirit of God comes, transforms, transfigures and becomes a holy deposit, it turns all of these pagans into children of God by making them the temple of God. The spirit comes to be in us and to make us places that people can see God at work. This is not about theology, no matter how many Bible verses I've just thrown about you. It's all about underlying the importance of relationship. The paraclete, the word used by Jesus to describe the ministry of the Holy Spirit, means advocate, comforter or helper. You see, this is part of God's plan because it is an attempt to restore all of humanity from the alienation of the garden to be back in friendship relationship with God not just the chosen few not just the holy huddle not just us at central but every man and woman boy and girl to become back into relationship with God my second quote comes from Henry Newen. And now the parents might recognise this from last year because it was on uh, the front of um, the teaching material that I've sent through. Without Pentecost, the Christ event, the life, death and resurrection of Jesus remains imprisoned in history as something to, to remember, think about and reflect on. The spirit of Jesus comes to dwell within us so that we can become living Christs here and now. Pentecost is important. It's important that we celebrate Pentecost. But more than that, it's important we celebrate the ministry and mission of the Holy Spirit. You see, his mission is not just to underline, to reveal the historical reality of Jesus. That's part of it. You need the Holy Spirit to have a revelation of who God is and who Jesus is. But his fundamental mission is to incarnate the reality into our everyday lives. Or I should say, to the reality of the incarnation into our everyday lives. For we are to become living Christ. We are to become Christians, little Christs. I wonder if you're familiar with the IKEA advert, the wonderful everyday. Really irritates me, um, if I'm honest. But the wonderful everyday is the kind of Christian that the Holy Spirit wants us to make. Those people who are grateful every day, count your blessings, name them one by one, and you'll be surprised at what the Lord has done. People who are in touch with God the Father so they can celebrate, even though we don't live in paradise. Even though we do have problems, we can still celebrate our relationship with God. That is the ministry of the paraclete. That is the ministry of the interceder between us and God. His ministry is to help us. Ultimately, to comfort us. Not to make us better uses, to help us draw closer to God, to bring our grief and our tears and our problems and our pain and to live with them, to live through them, to overcome them. Not so that we can be the best that we can be, but we can become the best. We can become just like Jesus. 
We can become better disciples, reflecting Christ to the world. We can be holy, just as he was holy. Now, I don't have problems with Pentecostals. I don't always enjoy their worship, but I don't have problems with Pentecostals. I don't have a problem with Charismatics. Don't always enjoy their worship either. What I do have a problem are those people that I try to affectionately call charismaniacs. Those people who is, are too busy pro focusing on power and gifts to focus on the reality of being made more like Christ. Ultimately, we are called to become just like Jesus. Them. Me, you, all of us, believe it or not, we're called to become more like Jesus, for he is the perfection of God in humanity. Now, I don't want to deny the place of gifts or the place of fruits, but what I do want to deny is the fact that one of the traps that this kind of thinking can lead into is selfishness and self-aggrandizement. I've actively encouraged people to reflect on their gifts of service. For any of you who have ever come to talk to me about what should I do in the future, I often point you back to what are your gifts, what are your skills, what are your calling, what are the things that God has given you to serve in the future. I have used it in preaching. We had an entire series on the subject. And all of this is that we may reflect Jesus' highest possible expression of worship. That Garden of Gethsemane moment where he says, Not my will, but yours. The author and perfecter of our faith demands, but he doesn't. Requires, not strong enough. He wants us to be holy, wholly given over to God, set aside for his purpose, because that's the ultimate meaning of holy. And it's this reality of the Holy Spirit's ministry that compels us towards mission, to sharing our faith, to evangelism, to outreach, whichever word you want to use. You see, the incarnation of Jesus, that which the Holy Spirit was intimately involved in from the very beginning, is the greatest expression of missional commitment ever made. Let me say that again. The incarnation of Jesus is the greatest expression of missional commitment ever made. He gave up heaven to become just like us. And that is unique to Christianity. No other religious system has a belief where, the God, where God gives up greatness, power, authority to become teeny weeny tiny baby that can't control its bladder, has to be wrapped up in um, swaddling clothes to be kept warm and has to be fed by his mother. The incarnation is the greatest expression of missional commitment ever. And we are called to carry on that because the Holy Spirit comes into us to transform us from the inside out to become a better version of Jesus or a more accurate version of Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 20 we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us we implore you on Christ's behalf be reconciled to God we are called to to tell people about this other place we are the ambassadors of that other place to a watching world and go back to the baptismal wording Matthew 28 19 therefore go and make disciples of all nations 
baptized in the name of the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. This continuous challenge has been there since before Jesus ascended. This challenge to make disciples, to bring people into relationship with God through the Holy Spirit, to be in a better relationship with God being washed clean and given white linen to, to, to demonstrate that, that, that new life has been there since before Pentecost, has before the ascension. It's one of those reasons why testimonies are so important. It's one of those reasons why if you go, ever go along to a, an evangelistic event, there will be somebody who shares their testimony. God has changed me. God is still changing people. God can change even you. And I think about the testimonies that have changed me, about the alcoholic who miraculously overnight had the desire for alcohol taken away. The wheelchair bound person who miraculously was able to walk after people prayed for them. The, pre the, the prisoner who miraculously came to saving faith after reading just a single verse in a horror novel. The miracle of one of the greatest theologians in the 20th century standing up before the world's press and saying, the most important thing I've ever learned is Jesus loves me, this I know, because the Bible tells me so. Four very different people, four di very different times, four very different testimonies. But God changed them and is still changing today. Some of the greatest testimonies comes from those humble Christians who have the courage to say to their friends, their family and their work colleagues, God loves you. Like the academic, like the person who would be criticised for saying Jesus loves me, this I know because the Bible tells me so. Just to share that simple message and face the criticism of opening up that part of our lives to people. They are incredible moments. We say to our friends and our family, God loves you and cares for you. I had the opportunity to talk to someone this, this week who wanted to talk to me about curses. And was able to say he loves you and he is more powerful than your fears or the curse that is on top of you. We can say he wants to show you a better way to live. We can be ambassadors. There is another land. There is another place. There is a better way. And we can say with incredible confidence, because we celebrated the resurrection 50 days ago, that he wants to give you eternal life. The door to heaven is open. Just have the faith to pray through it. Not step through it, but pray through it. Because if you wait till you step through it, it might be too late. We are reminded repeatedly that the ministry and mission of the Holy Spirit when we celebrate Easter. It's no surprise that you don't have Pentecost without Easter. God opens a door through Jesus and God the Father and God the Son exalted in heaven send the Spirit down to the tired, scared, frightened disciples who are hiding behind locked doors and now somehow have the courage to not only speak different languages but have the courage to preach Christ crucified, Christ resurrected and say come and be baptised. Something only Gentiles did if they wanted to become a God-fearer. You didn't say things like that to good Jewish men and women. And yet 3,000. 3,000 people that day come to faith. My final quote.
comes from a uh, a very famous Pentecostal um, evangelist called Smith Mick Wigglesworth. Uh, Pentecost came with the sound of a mighty rushing wind, a violent blast from heaven. Heaven has not exhausted its blasts, but our danger is we are getting frightened of them. Smith Wigglesworth is one of those people who was preaching towards the end of the great revival that came out of Azusa Street in the 19th century. He began to see the Holy Spirit not go away, but begin to recede in people's life as the revival movement began to peter out. You see, every Christian can backpedal. Now, please note, I didn't say backslide. That's a possibility as well. But we have a God that forgives so that when we backpedal, we can be forgiven and we can start forward pedaling again. But make no mistake, it doesn't take long to start falling backwards if you're backpedaling. And it's not a surprise, not a surprise to any of us. In a age where we fight the world, the flesh and the devil, uh, Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 to 3, we are worn down and we become worn out. It doesn't surprise me. Think how much we've changed in the last 14 to 16 months. Think how tired we are from being alone all the time. Think how much the devil is enjoying the fact that not as many people are participating in worship to be built up as disciples and the church is not being fully released to call people not just to worship but to faith we, we turn again to paul galatians chapter 5 and i spoke about this very recently since we live by the spirit paul is under no shadow of doubt we live by the spirit this is what it means to be spiritual, to be reliant, dependent, in touch with the spirit. We have to therefore keep in step with him. How do we do that? Verse 22. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. No wonder we're tired. These are hard work. They're hard work if you do them spiritually with the help of the holy spirit and they're even harder if you try and do it by yourself and just like any fruit if they are neglected if these things fail to be nurtured and fed by the holy spirit they will fall from the tree we will fall from the tree and begin to rot this is what happens when you don't keep in step with the Spirit. You begin to do it by yourself and you don't grow properly. In fact, you begin to wither and die. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. <gasps> I wish. But that's one of the challenges to us. One of the best definitions of worship I ever read self upon the cross and Christ upon the throne since we live by the spirit let us keep in step with the spirit self upon the cross Christ upon the throne Holy Spirit teach me teach us enable us to bear fruit that demonstrate our discipleship that shows a watching world that there is another better holier perfect way the reasons why Paul warns us to to make sure we keep in step of the spirit is found in verse 26 let us not become conceited provoking and envying each other if we build a spirituality that's based upon us upon our us and us alone then we are in danger of becoming conceited being puffed up about who we are and what we can do that through that we might then go on to cause trouble by provoking my gifts are better than yours and envying oh i wish i had those gifts and doing nothing we are a call to be a people who crucifies the flesh 
but actually keeps in step with the Holy Spirit of God as he directs us to direct others back to God. It's not about us in any way, shape or form. It's all about him. And as I sit here as a pastor, I can tell you that's a huge weight and a huge worry because I know I'm not perfect. You know you're not perfect. Anyone who watches this video or any video about the ministry of the Holy Spirit and says they don't need him or they don't uh, require him are wrong because we need the Spirit to keep us in step with God. And we don't always get it right. We don't always keep in step. Sometimes we are out of step. Sometimes we're walking backwards. Sometimes we're rolling when we should be walking. But that's what the cross is for. To receive, to offer. And the Holy Spirit helps us to receive the forgiveness that God gives us. And all of this is important. Why am I banging on about it? Because, as I mentioned last week, 1971, the year I was born, was the time that they removed uh, Whitson or Whit Monday from the calendar. Now, I've never went to church when I was a boy. Hatchings, matchings and dispatchings was it. And I never heard of Pentecost or Whitson until I came became a Christian. In fact, it was a couple of years after I became a Christian that I first ever heard Whitson. My granddad told me about it. And the reality is, if you go to Europe, they still celebrate Whit Monday. But in our country and for my generation, it's been removed by a secular agency and has just become Spring Bank Holiday. And yet we have generations growing up who have never heard of Jesus, let alone Whitson, let alone Pentecost. We need to be a people that celebrate his ministry. We need to be a people that trumpet this day. We need to be a people that remember that the mission and ministry of the Holy Spirit is absolutely linked to Easter, is absolutely linked to salvation. And is absolutely linked to the first ever Pentecost. The first celebrations of harvest. Now this is where I agree with my Pentecostal and charismatic friends. We can't just celebrate it on one day. We need to celebrate it every day. I like the title of that classic book. Good morning, Holy Spirit, because it reminds us that the Holy Spirit is a person. It's not a force like in Star Wars. It is a person who comes personally into our lives. One commentator said this, and I really like this. The fellowship with the Holy Spirit begins after anyone confesses the Lordship of Christ over their lives. This companionship is sustained through constant communication and can be likened to the relationship building process experienced in marriage, where a unique bond is created between a couple through constant association. The fellowship gets better with him and it's renewed if the believer does not ignore the Holy Spirit, who as a person can be grieved. We can grieve the Holy Spirit of God. We can. By closing ourselves off, by not being fruitful, by just a rude word or even an unholy thought. We need to celebrate Pentecost, but we also need to celebrate Pentecost every day and dare I even say every moment of every day. You see, all the time and the effort, and it does require time and effort, to grow fruit, to grow in the Spirit, to keep in step with the Spirit, plus the inevitable call to holiness that comes with it. It is fascinating that the Pentecostal church movement came out of the holiness movement that existed beforehand. 
it can make these things can make us very uncomfortable in the world and slightly scared and slightly fretful or even frightened as Muggleworth put it of what the Holy Spirit can highlight and what the Holy Spirit can do but just to remind you the answer to this fear he is our advocate he is our um, comforter he is there to help us not to become the best versions of us, but become our version of the best, to become more like Jesus. We can have faith and must trust him. The third person of the Godhead has been sent into all the world, to Jew and to Gentile, to change it. Or more accurately, change us from the inside out so that we can change the world. He may be mysterious, he may be demanding, but the comforter, the paraclete, is there to help us. And so therefore we never need to be afraid. As I draw this service to a close, I wish there was some witty remark or some story I could tell you to kind of sum up these three quotes, but there isn't. The job of keeping in step with the Spirit is hard work. Always has been, always will be. Pentecost this day, we celebrate the birthday of the church because the Spirit came into the lives of people who live sacrificially and live to the glory of God. The church grew by such vast numbers and such speed because there was a world waiting to hear a message from people who, had, who gave themselves so completely because their God had given themselves so completely. As we come out of lockdown, as we are new wine, different wine, unusual wine being poured into old wineskins, things are going to change. Things are going to have to adapt. And we need the Holy Spirit to guide us through each of those. So bring your gifts. Bring your challenging behaviour. Bring your hopes. Bring your fears. Bring your joys. Bring your worries. Bring all that you have and all that God gives you into this thing called the church and we, through the power of the Spirit and to the glory of God, will make a difference to this world. Because God, as we wake up in the morning, says, good morning, di disciple. And we need to be a people who learn to say, good morning, Holy Spirit. Let's pray together. O oh Lord, our Lord, on this birthday of the church, hallelujah. In the coming of the Spirit, hallelujah. And the ever-present promise in our lives, a deep hallelujah. We are frightened sometimes of what you might say to us, O Spirit. We are worried sometimes what you might require of us, O Son. And Heavenly Father, we are terrified what you might say to us at the end of the age. But between now and then, take us, transform us, grow fruit within us, help us to use our gifts, but above all, help us to keep in step with you, O Holy Spirit. Amen.
Come, living Lord, live within our hearts, for you are welcome here. Come, like a gentle dove, settle us with your grace and peace. We welcome your Spirit's presence to calm us. Like a mighty wind, roaring with power from on high, we welcome your spirit's freedom to move deeply in us. Come, like an untamed fire, raging with holiness, we welcome your spirit's beauty to burn brightly through us. For you are truly welcome here. 